going to your butt. Da -da -da. <laughs> Welcome to episode 62 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. And tonight is a special and spooky night as we come to you straight from the Boo Barn to discuss Civil War and Paranormal once again. Joined, as always, by my co-host, Bloody Mary Fincher, and our special guest, Jen Vincent Price. I am merely a floating head in a jar called Darren. What's going on? What is going on, ghouls? <laughs> I thought your intro was awesome. That's hilarious. That's awesome. You really need to do the intros every single time. Oh, you just don't want to do it anymore. So, hey, what's, what is going on? It's, a, it's Halloween. It's the greatest time of the year. There's the smell of wood burning stoves and pumpkin beer in the air and in my car and uh <laughs> and it's time to talk halloween and ghosts and ghouls again it feels yep. like we were just here yeah, yeah it seems like it was probably because we've all listened to the episode recently yeah we, we were have. laughing yeah. about how funny we are we did yeah so if y'all haven't listened to our uh first halloween episode go give it a listen because it was a really good time and you might learn something about ghosts in the civil war yeah definitely a lot of fun to talk about now this is not a very serious type of talk this is one that you don't have to believe in ghosts or not, like we said last time. Everyone loves those campfire stories talking about ghosts and goblins, whether you believe in the stuff or not. So if you don't happen to believe in it, that's totally cool. Just sit back and enjoy and tell some ghost stories and listen to some of the stuff we say. And if you do, hey, that's cool too. We're not here to judge. But I think it's uh, it's always fun talking about this. And imagine the American Civil War has got a whole bunch of ghost stories. But before we start talking about ghosts, we have some other spirits to talk about, Mary. We do. And I think we should let our guests go first with what are you drinking and what mug? I am drinking Goose Island 312 Lemonade Shandy, which is a summer thing, but it's what I had in the house. And my brother works for Goose Island, so I'm a little biased there. But I am drinking it in a Baby Yoda mug. Nice. Because it's the closest thing I could find to Patrick Claiborne. <laughs> Patrick Claiborne is our... Uh, <laughs> Jen and I made Patrick Claiborne up uh, about a week ago <laughs> one night. Very cool. Okay. That's, his hell that's that's Claiborne's Halloween name now is Patrick yes. Claiborne. It's going to stick. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what antifreeze drink are you drinking tonight, Mary? Okay, so I am drinking a beer called, and it's funny considering what you called me tonight, I'm drinking one called Blood Moon. It's an orange sour. But then the okay. other beer I have, because I'll probably get into a second one tonight, is called Cat Lady. And that is for Jen because <laughs> she has she has pet cats and she's also got pet bunnies. So I'm like, well, that'll be my little tribute to her. And I'm drinking it out of my George Henry Thomas mug because it was around this time in 1863 that he actually took over command of, I believe it was the Army of the Cumberland from Rosecrans. Very cool. Very cool. And since you didn't ask, I am drinking. It's just about to. Time Anywho, Timekeeper IPA from Four Score. Timekeeper kind of has a creepy name to it. I think, I don't know, that's the best I could do. And I'm drinking out of my mug that says Pancake Man on it because it says Pancake Man. And I think he's kind of scary. So I went with that. I was going to say real original for Halloween weeks. That works. Have you seen the Pancake Man? You wouldn't be joking <laughs> if you have. <laughs> that sounds really creepy, actually. It does kind of sound creepy. Yeah. So hence the mug, judgmental. Anyway, so tonight we're talking Halloween again. We're talking Civil War stories. And so... People don't realize that the Civil War has a fantastic paranormal stories to it. So we're going to tell some stories ourselves. We'll talk a little bit about some of the, the connections between Halloween and the Civil War. And we'll talk about what a haunting actually is. So I think, Mary, I think you can take the floor first and talk a little bit about um, about how the whole thing kind of ties together. Yeah. So Halloween and the Civil War, it's not like we think of it now. All Hallows Eve traces its origins like back to the, kind of the 8th century when Pope Gregory III made November the 1st, All Saints Day, which um, made October the 31st, All Hallows Eve. And it goes back even before that to, I think it's a festival called Sam Sahame, Sahame. I think, I think it, there's different pronunciations, but I know one of them is Samhain or Salmon. Depend yeah, it depends salmon. on where you're from, how yeah. you say it. Yeah. So that it, it goes back very, very far. Like a lot of, you know, traditions that we have today, they can trace their back their themselves back to pagan times. So in America, Halloween traces its origins back mid 1800s in the US due to an influx of Scottish, English and Irish immigrants. And they brought with them the tradition of carving turnips or rutabagas, which eventually became carving pumpkins. And they did this to ward off evil spirits on the eve of All Saints Day which All Saints Day is November the 1st. Um, so this was paired with other traditional harvest season activities, including corn husking, apple peeling, costumes, and parties. And today this is known as Halloween. When it first arrived in, arrived in the U.S., only Maryland and the Southern colonies participated in it. 1850, Americans across the country were dressing up and knocking on doors in hopes of receiving food or money, which today is known as trick-or-treating. And there's a couple times it is mentioned in the newspapers in the Peoria Morning Mail on November 2nd, 1862, 
they reported about Halloween. This old-time anniversary, which took place on Friday evening, was made the excuse by some of our wild boys for throwing on savory missiles, putrid vegetables, taking gates off of the hinges, and sundry other pranks. This was probably good fun to the boys, but for those thus attacked, it was not so desirable. So as we know, there is, I believe, the evening before Halloween is Devil's Night. That sounds like what they were up to there. And then there was another article I found where the quote was, Some gentlemen called and we had cards. After they left, Lucy and I tried our fortunes in Diver's Way as it was Halloween. We tried all magic arts and had a merry frolic, but no future lord and master came to turn our wet garments. Whatever the fuck that means, I don't know. But apparently these ladies are up to something on, on Halloween. Sounds um, like a good party. Right I know. Now. I was like, what are you up to? And there was all... Do they called somebody 25 times that night. Hey. jeez. Oh, <laughs> anyway, there was also in Harper's Weekly on October 26, 1861, there was a Grim Reaper Jeff Davis. And if anybody has seen that, it's a very creepy drawing of Jeff Davis. It's kind of a Grim, Grim Reaper and he's carrying like dead bodies and stuff. And he looks just like a zombie. But that's where the origins begin. It's not as embedded as, say, Christmas was during the Civil War where you have the soldiers like, you know, they're sending Christmas cards out and stuff like that. And even Valentine's Day, which we talked about in our Valentine's Day episode where they were sending Valentine's Day. You know, I, I don't think they were trick-or-treating in the camps or anything like that. But it was still very much like it was sort of getting gaining ground around at that point that well, probably well, I, I heard a story of jeff davis dressed up as a woman one time maybe that's what that was <laughs> Right? Could be. Yeah, you never know. You never know. But yeah. But yeah, it was starting to gain ground, but it wasn't what it is today at all. But there's definitely there was definitely the traditions that existed at that time for, for Halloween. I wonder if somebody's wagon got egged back in eighteen sixty. Probably that's probably what the Confederates and the Union did to each other on Halloween night. They probably like <laughs> They egged, egged everybody. They egged everybody, and I don't know. if they had, <laughs> sorry, we're not, we can't eat this month. All the eggs got thrown. Yeah, so it's okay. Go, go finish eating that pine cone. Let's get back. Let's get back to the battle. It's interesting how it goes, and you know, you, you talk about hauntings, and there's a whole bunch of different types of hauntings. And anybody who studies this has uh, has gone through these. I haven't thought about these in a while. You know how many types of hauntings there actually are? Oh, at least a dozen. No, I mean types of haunting, not examples of haunt, hauntings. No, Jeez. two. There's actually six, Jen. Okay. Okay, close, so we'll go through these real of. quick. Okay, sure. The most popular one is residual haunting. Now, this is the one where the, it's an imprint. It's like a videotape or an audio tape of, of a ghost that's just running, and it just comes and goes. The ghost or whatever it is doesn't even aware that it's even there. Uh, usually, it's it's replayed in moments of high trauma, so like battlefields, for example. So somebody may go to the battlefield and see a ghost of a horse or a of a soldier walking by, and he, he acts like he's completely oblivious to your presence. That's That would be considered basically... A, a residual type haunting. And that's probably the most popular one. The next one is called a poltergeist haunting. And people have heard the phrase because of the movie. This is really not really a haunting at all by, by real ghost definition. What it really is, is it's just misplaced energy that's put in a in kind of a powerful place that's sometimes a destructive place. And it's almost like energy being channeled through people or places that causes on that causes damage. So for some reason, it seems that a lot of these poltergeist type energy things tend to manifest with younger girls. It just that's just statistically or was sometimes after a pelican attack or a bad haircut. Who knows? Maybe that's exactly where it comes from. Jeez. But I, but it's certainly it's certainly one that actually does does have part of that. It was a peacock. Um, these are all whatever it was. I think that um I think these are kind of active type hauntings too or intelligent hauntings, right? So that's kind of how that one is. The fourth one which I think is the creepiest one is a doppelganger type haunting because I don't think that'd be fun at all. What that really is, is a um, almost a double person of yourself that only you can see. And if you can see it, that means something bad is basically about to happen to you is what it really is. So if you're walking on the street and you see a five foot four girl carrying an IPA strolling up the street towards the DQ, and it's you seeing that person, Mary, you might want to, you might want to go inside and lock the door. Okay. Um, the fifth one is demonic hauntings. Obviously, these are the ones that um, is is not a ghost at all. It's just a, it's just a, just a demon. It was never a person. These tend to be focused on places more than people itself, like houses or caves or things like that. The sixth one is the mo is another common one. It's called the shadow haunting. These are the shadow people. I mean, people talk about these things all the time, and it's just kind of you see it out of the corner of your eye, and you look and it's gone. These can be people. These could be animals. These could be anything. But really, for the most part, that's where most of you hear the story of a haunting. It's usually one of those. Most of the stories that we'll probably tell tonight 
pretend to be falling that residual field because that's kind of what they are by definition. But there are a lot of different ones. And I think that's why when people go study these things, the first thing they need to do is find out what they're dealing with, right? Like if you watch Ghost Hunters, for example, if you watch these shows, that's what they're doing for the most part. But it's interesting because you can kind of get an idea of the history of something that took place there to get an idea of what's what energy is still there. Exactly. Yeah, that's one thing I like about ghost tours is that you learn some of the history that you wouldn't necessarily get at the battle or on the battlefield. You'll learn some of the other things about like people in the town and stuff like that, where these things took place. You find out more about the civilian side of it on the ghost tours, but they always tie the history into it. Yeah, well, I think I remember that from when we recorded with you last year, and you talk, talked about that one story where you were with your friend and her daughter, and there was that one ghost of that girl that had died and basically been neglected by her family. Yeah, You know, you're finding out the history behind that. It's a very sad history. But like, for me, I think these ghost tours are as much a part of the battlefields where they're at as they are like the history of the battle themselves because like you said you're learning about the people about the townspeople and you know sometimes there's even ghost stories that date back to the civil war oh there are there are a whole bunch that do and we're going to talk a lot about those stories mayor and jen Mm -hmm. a little bit about this so jen so rumor has you got some stories for us i do i do i have a couple personal experiences again and then i remember we all have to sleep tonight okay so i don't want to hear any situations of having to be at four o'clock in the morning look here mr marble's running around my kitchen Okay, I'll scratch that one off the list. No, don't. Um, You're free to tell it. Because <laughs> there were two things that I had I had kind of looked up other stories that I wasn't familiar with, and I found a couple topics that I thought were interesting. One is that during the Battle of Gettysburg, supposedly they saw the ghost of George Washington twice. So that's one that I'll, I can talk about that one first. Yeah. And then I somehow got on a tangent of headless horsemen of the Civil War. So I brought those two with me as well. The stories of George Washington are really interesting supposedly, and this is just the history that I read on it, the 20th Maine was headed for Gettysburg, but they were not there. They were going there. They weren't sure where they were going. They were kind of confused. And they said a man on a tall white horse with a tricorner hat on rode up in front of them and kind of gestured and told them to follow and led them toward the town. So that's one story where they think it might have been, according to Chamberlain, who actually wrote about this, some of the soldiers thought that was George Washington. And then another Another sighting of him there was also with the 20th Maine, and they said that when they did the charge at Little Round Top, you know, the soldiers were were ready to do it when they were given the order, but the ghost of Washington appeared again, and it looked like his sword was on fire, and he gave a second order to charge, and that's when they all went running down the hill. Wow. So those are the two from of George Washington, supposedly, at Gettysburg. And I actually have a quote from Chamberlain here that was interesting. He wrote, because he wrote about this. He wrote about everything. But he said, we know not what mystic power may be possessed by those who are now bivouacking with the dead. I only know the effect, but I dare not explain or deny the cause. Who shall say that Washington was not among the number of those who aided the country he founded? So that's from Chamberlain's writings. Chamberlain, people aren't going to like this story, Jen. (laughs) It wasn't him who ordered the charge. He was was right. It was was George Washington. Oh, wow. (laughs) And Chamberlain wrote about it. He said, yeah, I don't, I don't know that it wasn't him. Wow. That's pretty cool. That's such a, that's a great example of like a ghost story from the Civil War period to show yeah. that this goes back mm-hmm. to even then they were seeing ghosts on this And this, this was the other, the other soldiers were reporting this. Yeah. And that's because when I first heard about that, I thought, okay, this is some shenanigans. I'm going to see what's going on here. And then I found quotes from, and that was taken from like the Joshua Chamberlain Museum, like their ar- archives online. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's his writing. And that just floored me because I was not expecting to find anything. You know, I expected to find that it was a hoax or a joke. Mm-hmm. And it was like, oh, no, it's it's serious. He wrote about it. That was very cool. That's a really good story. Well, especially back then, they probably couldn't explain it, right? Like, how do you explain a guy that's not, that's dressed in clothes that are not, you know, like clearly. Well, they said he was clearly wearing like the tricorner hat, which was definitely not a Civil War style. Yeah. Sure wasn't John Burns. No, it was not John Burns. <laughs> He was War of 1812. They had yeah, a different different, different, different yeah, part of the battle. Different fashion much. there, Darren. I just heard old, old, old guys seem to be lost wearing old clothes. I just assumed <laughs> it happened. Yeah. Yeah, different different area of the battlefield. But it was. It was. Yeah, no, he was yelling at people to get off his lawn is what I heard. That's true. That's true. Nice. That's what I thought. I've reached that stage of my life now. It's amazing. 
They are. You certainly are. <laughs> no, it's it's a great story. I mean, Get, Gettysburg is one. I got a good st- Gettysburg story. I'll talk to you real quick and uh, about all these because it's, it's it's just interesting as you go to these and people like the Gettysburgs, like the Antietams, like the Franklins of the world. They they flock to these places and you know people. You know, some people get aggravated with the ghost people in a town like Gettysburg, but you know what? Though anything that brings people to the town, I'm all for it. And you know, hopefully they see some of the history too. But since we're talking this, I'm going to talk about Iverson's Pits real quick. Everyone's been there over in the first day's battlefield, and it's probably one of the more haunted and more active places on the battlefield by people who study this stuff. So real quick, on the, uh, the first day of the battle on July 1st, 1863, you need Army of the Potomac and Robert Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. They bumped into each other in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, resulting in the largest and bloodiest fight in the Western Hemisphere. So early in the part of the battle on Oak Ridge, which is just north of the town, a Confederate division under Robert Rhodes, who's under um, Richard Ewell's corps, was attacking James Wadsworth and John Cleveland Robinson's divisions of the Union First Corps, right? So Rhodes' attack was screwed up from the beginning because one of his brigade commanders, Edward O'Neill from, from Alabama, he stepped off too early. They're all supposed to go together in one big line, but for whatever reason, he went instead of the rest of the division. He Leroy Jenkins did, and he went in, and it screwed up the entire battle plan on that first day. After YOLOing it, basically, O'Neill, he gets <laughs> driven back pretty quick, uh, and he kind of screwed up the entire plan is what he did. So Iverson's brigade now is sitting back across an open field near that Thomas Forney farm directly in front of Henry Baxter's Union Brigade on Oak Ridge, right? So he, they're sitting there waiting for their turn, and no one's really doing anything. So the night before, Iverson got himself good and right with Liquor Mary. That was the problem. <laughs> and he didn't make the charge because... <laughs> He was too hung over, and he was also out of Pedialyte, so he had to stay back, and he could not go. He was not feeling well. He could not make the charge. All he said to his, to his brigade was, give him hell, and he stayed back, and he watched. This is 1,470 men uh, going forward, <laughs> marching out like they're on a parade. Now, because of the undulations, that's what they oh, are, on the, on the field of the natural grass, they couldn't see the Union Field uh, First Corps, so the battle line was behind a stone wall near today's Oak Ridge Observation Tower. And they were there's a wall, right? That's where they all were. Once they got to within 80 yards of these unseen federal soldiers, including James Bates, 12 Massachusetts, and Benazit Foss, 88 Pennsylvania, the feds rose up in double ranks and just blasted them. Killed 510 instantly, but the number was probably closer to 750. So after Robinson's men broke before the 11th, by the way, just keep that mm-hmm. in mind, Iverson yes. went out. He went out. To, <laughs> he, he went out to find his soldiers, five hundred plus dead, lying right where they fell, like they were cordwood, all in a big long line. Some were shot as many as many times as five times in the head. That's how many times these guys got hit. They got absolutely pounded. They were all buried in a shallow trench, just thrown in. They remained there until the eighteen seventies, and what was left of their bodies, by being in that rich Pennsylvania soil and being in the heat, well, not probably not much, was moved to North Carolina. The place where that the, that burial ground was, where the bodies are gone, and there's, there's probably a lot of them still there. Realistically, is called Iverson's Pits, and if you go there now, you can still sort of see the indentation of where the ground was. There's still like a yeah. little little swale, right? It's supposed to be one of the more active paranormal spots on the battlefield. In eighteen ninety eight, a guy named Lieutenant Montgomery. He was a survivor in the 12th North Carolina. He went back and he visited and he always he commented how green the grass was where the pits were because of all the natural fertilizer of these dead people over the years. Oh. Thomas Forney, the farmer, the owner, always talked about how great his crops grew in that area because of the fertilizer. So he was planting crops where these guys were dead, where their bodies were moved, but he said they, um, his, his crops always grew strong at that, part of the, at that part of the field, on this field. He would say at night he could hear distant screams from the field that he couldn't explain. His workers would not go out there at night. They refused to. If you see the field today, it's sometimes it's just a big, clear field. Sometimes it's got corn. It's got a whole bunch of stuff. It depends on when you, what town when you go. But over the years, people have talked specifically about when there's been corn fields. They'd go out there and they would... They would see shadowy figures walking in the corn. They would hear people walking on the, on the areas next to them. And there was never anybody there. And to this day, people go there all the time. If you go to visit Gettysburg, you're going to go to Devil's Den, you're going to go to Spangler Spring, and you're going to go to Iris's Pits. But um, it's one of those places you go that is, to this day, is still a magnet for people who study this stuff because of all the creepy things that happen there. Yeah, and Thomas Forney, he would, um, he would always talk about just the here and the stuff. Imagine being living on a farm in the middle of nowhere and you, you hear the, the farmhouse is long gone now, but just imagine 
hear and stuff, hearing screams and yells from this field in your yard. There's nobody out there from this place. And it's still one of the creepier places. If you ever go there at night, you know, while the park is still open, well, that suggests and break any rules, Jen. <laughs> but if you go out there at night, it's a creepy place to walk at at night if you do it. Like you did last year at the O statue where you scared those kids? Don't know what That's still about one of my statues. favorite stories. <laughs> <laughs> those kids will live for the rest of their lives saying how they saw a legless ghost. They probably thought it was sickles, but they saw a legless <laughs> ghost at the OO statue in, uh, in Gettysburg. And you know what? I'm just happy to play along. That's funny. <laughs> but it's definitely a cool place to go to Iverson's, but no question about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very powerful, creepy spot. I know I've been there once before, and it was like, kind of you get chills being there, you know, just knowing what it, it, It's so. one of those weird feeling places yeah. you go, and you, it's just, you go there, and you can just, if you know the history too, when you walk down there, and you go in that little swale behind the 88th Pennsylvania Monument that's kind of down in the field a little bit, if you go out there where that's pretty much where the bodies were, you definitely get a weird feeling, especially when it's dark. No, it's, it's definitely worth a visit. If you go, if you've, have you been to Iverson's Pits before, Jen? I think so. I think so. But yeah. yeah, I'm supposed to, I'm going, I'm leaving very soon to go see my friends that live in Sharpsburg. And we uh -huh. usually take a day trip to Gettysburg. So I'm going to make sure we go over there. Yeah. Yeah. So what you do is you go find the 12th Massachusetts Monument, right? Okay. And you just, there's a little path and you'll walk down a path and you're going to, out in the path is probably maybe, 80 yards, 100 yards, you're going to see a little stone coming out of the ground, maybe like three feet tall, so probably like Mary height. That's the monument of the 88th Pennsylvania. Okay. If you go there and just go a little behind it, you'll notice the ground for maybe like 100 yards, there's going to be a plane and it's going to be a little lower. Okay. And that's called, that's Iverson's Pits right there. You can't okay. miss it, but yeah. it's very cool. I feel like I've seen it, but I would like to go again now that I know the stories. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really creepy, but really good story. Yeah. And he so. said, I was going to give everybody nightmares. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> He's really thinking all day, what can I tell? What can I talk about? Definitely. So what's, what's, what, what do you got next? Who's next? I can go next. I, I think right. it's Mary's turn. Yeah, I'm going to take all us right. into the Western Theater to the battle that we just had an episode about, Battle of Perryville, a few episodes ago. And this is actually one about an animal. As we know, at the Battle of Perryville, uh, Patrick Claiborne fought there. And when he was riding into battle, his, his horse was not just shot from under him, but completely annihilated by artillery. And Claiborne fell, obviously, was... You know, fell off the horse and that's how he injured his ankle. But anyway, one of the more common stories from the Battle of Perryville is that soon after the battle, locals reported hearing a horse galloping by them when they were, you know, on this one road, but there was never a horse there. And to this day, that horse still gallops and people hear it. It'll just gallop down this one road. And it's apparently the road that you know, he would have been on riding this horse before the horse was killed. So that's a residual haunting, right? That would be a residual haunting, definitely. Yeah, so apparently um, it happens to animals too. That Apparently you saw Mr. Dead. That's who that was. <laughs> Mr. Dead. That's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Expecting to see like zombie Claiborne on a horse now. Yeah, right? So, uh, <laughs> Wilbur. The one Boo, oh. Wilbur. <laughs> <laughs> the Walking Dead Civil War edition. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, that's Hans glue, glue factories. Oh, I know, but, I but know. Yeah, it's Claiborne's horse Dixie that that haunts uh, haunts Perryville, and I thought that was an interesting one to tell because it's one about an animal, which is one that you don't hear a lot about in the Civil War. And just the other one I had from Perryville was um, two reenactors were asleep in their tent one night. They were awakened by who they thought was another reenactor, and he was pretty riled up. And he was looking for somebody. He just barged into their tent and he demanded to know where one of the other soldiers was. And they didn't recognize him as part of their group. This guy keeps calling the soldier's name as he's walking around this reenactor's tent. And finally, the, the two reenactors, they're, they're like, okay, dude, what, what's your name and rank? So the guy kind of stops and tells them, but then he proceeds to just walk around really angrily looking for this one soldier. He was an officer. He just stormed out of the tent. And the two reenactors start following him and then he just disappears so they went and looked him out up and found out that both he and the guy he was looking for had been killed at the battle of perryville so that was too that was the other ghost story i found from the battle of perryville was that one there so that's, that would be imagine that be brutal that wouldn't yeah. you like if you're reenacting and like somebody comes into your tent and just yeah. starts like yelling and you're like you're not part of our group where are you from yeah, this guy's taking the role playing a little too far yeah That'd be creepy. I mean, anybody coming in a tent would be creepy anyway, but just especially if it's a ghost. 
I think I'd rather have a ghost. You're always probably going to disappear than some dude, you know? Yeah, but this was a but, ghost but that just disappeared. Like, he that's what I mean. Disappeared. Yeah. Like, that'd be like, do you really see that? Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. But yeah, like, and I've that's... heard other stories like that that happen at reenactments where, like, you think you're talking to another reenactor and it, it turns out it's like they just walk away and they kind of disappear, right? But that one was, I was like, whoa, that's... <laughs> Those guys must have been freaked out after that. Oh, God. That reminds me of a story where, I, you know, in Gettysburg story, there's a reenactment going on. There were two soldiers just, you know, putting their cartridges into their guns. This they obviously don't fire actual real rounds, just putting in, you know, black powder. And some guy ran up to him and said, hey, um, are you out of ammo? Hey, I got some here. And he left it and ran away. The, the guy picked up the thing. It was like a 150-year-old like cartridge box with actual bullets in it. And they, and they must have been worth a lot of money. And they couldn't find the guy. And it, wow. it's like who knows was that was that a ghost was that re- was that real but he says yeah it was, it was dropped in it was a it was a full complete package but it was old you could tell and I'm, I'm not sure if they had it authenticated or whatever but it was it was it was original from the period so maybe it was some old soldier come back trying to help out some some uh, some peers like dropping ammo off and you never know right you never wow, know that's crazy wow. so that reenactor you see might be a ghost you never know well, you can tell by the, the the patented reenactor cut clothes. That's the first <laughs> giveaway. It's probably a real reenactor. <laughs> Jeez. But, but, but if, but if you, I'm kidding, kidding, maybe. But you never know. You never know. So always give them a little, you know, give them one of those. Yeah. So you can put your finger through. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we were back to Jen, and I believe you had your headless horseman, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was actually going to tell a real quick funny just because Darren was talking about reenactors at Gettysburg. Yeah. Some of the guys in my old unit were actually like extras on filming the movie Gettysburg. Like when they're interviewing Armistead, one of the guys in the background with a bedroll on was our old captain from my reenacting unit. But they were, you know, camping there. And about two in the morning, they were all pretty drunk and they decided to go down and wander up to Devil's Den because they're reenactors and they were drinking. So let's go do something stupid. So they get there and one of the trash cans was glowing. Like they couldn't find a source for it, but almost huh. like like a campfire glowing. And like some of the guys could see it and some of them couldn't. But like one guy pulled out a book and could read by the light from this glowing garbage can. And they never did figure out what caused it to glow like that. Wow. Creepy. Almost like a ghost campfire, kind of. Yeah, that's so, creepy. Which I thought was interesting. Oh, it's always fun putting the wool on, walking Gettysburg, and someone looks and go, and you look at them and go, oh my God, you can see me? <laughs> and just walk away. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> or like what you did to oh, those good. kids when they came up without you? Boo. Oh, God. Hey, I, gave, I gave them a story. <laughs> I gave them a story, so. Yeah, you did. They'll tell it forever. Yeah, you better hope they're not fans of the show. They'll be like, man, he tricked us. He had no well, legs. Be- the kids like good don't go back to therapy anymore it was it was a joke (laughs) yeah so the other one the headless horseman story is actually a um it was a lieutenant colonel who i think was part of um rosecrans staff it was julius p garesh i guess is how you say yeah yeah but um he was he was he was killed right on the railroad line right by where the, the national cemetery is now and they said he was just the cannonball just literally sliced his head right off. Mm-hmm. And they it's funny because I I was I thought there was more than one headless horseman, but supposedly they say they see this guy at Stone River, of course. They've seen him like Chickamauga claims that they see him there. And then I was listening to a different mm-hmm. podcast and they were talking about Goza Franklin and the guy said that he's in Franklin too. So apparently this guy travels around a little bit. Wow. But he's definitely, they say he's definitely at Stone's River. And then I think last year, Mary, you had talked about Old Green Eyes. Yep. Some people say that's a headless horseman ghost, a headless ghost of the Civil War. Wow. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting. So I wanted to, I didn't want to go through the whole story again, but I wanted to tell you that when I was doing headless horseman research, Green Eyes came up again. I do, I do remember reading that. And like the interesting thing about Garrosh is not only was he on Rosecrans' staff, he was his best friend. Okay, as well. I didn't find that. He was killed like right in front of Rosecrans. Like Rosecrans was covered in his blood. The jacket that Rosecrans was wearing, obviously he could never wear it again. But he took all the buttons off of it and he carried them around in his pocket for the rest of his life. I've, you know, I've kind of thought on my own, just like reading between the lines kind of thing and just some other articles I've read that, you know, one of the, thi- one of the reasons why Rosecrans like had PTSD at the Battle of Chickamauga, which like I believe is what he had was because of what he witnessed happen to Garage. But it would make sense if he was at Chickamauga as well. Maybe he was just riding around trying, you know, trying to keep, you know, if it was, he was killed so quickly. Yeah. He didn't believe he was dead. He just kept following them. So he's at the places. Now, Rosecrans wasn't at Franklin, but Rosecrans was definitely at Chickamauga, obviously. That's interesting. He appears there. But yeah, he was Rosecrans' best friend. 
Very cool. They say they see him like near where he was killed and they've seen him writing other places where he was before he was killed. And sometimes like through the cemetery itself is what I was reading is that they've seen him just all around that area. Oh, wow. That's like, oh my God, that's creepy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be yeah, watching it for him when I go to Stones River. Yeah. yeah. Headless, headless Mr. Dead. <laughs> oh, thanks. Mr. Dead. Is he riding Claiborne's horse now? Might have been. Might have been. Hey, who believes in reincarnation? Who believes in that stuff? I do. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to tell you a story about a guy named Jeffrey Keene and his wife. Back in 1991, they decided to go visit Antietam. He's an assistant fire chief at the time. And they're going to Sharpsburg, Maryland to do some antique shopping. Probably because dragged by his wife for that. But he also wanted to go visit the battlefield. And so, like most people on the auto tour, they end up stopping at all the spots. End up stopping at the sunken road, which was probably flooded at the time. Now, during the Battle of Antietam, Real quick, the battle had started at Miller's Cornfield and shifted its way south to Bloody Lane or the Sunken Road. Now, this is for three hours, 6,000 Union troops under William French and Israel Richardson are going to battle D.H. Hill and Richard Anderson's 8,000 reps. And it's going to be a three-hour-long battle going from about 9 in the morning to about 12, 1230. And the area on the Sunken Road is some of the most vicious, punishing fighting in the entire American Civil War. Within D.H. Hill's division, there is a colonel of the 12th Alabama named John Gordon, okay, you may have heard of him, Mary. Yes. Okay, he did, he did some stuff after the battle, right? So Gordon was ordered by Hill to hold the sunken road. And while there, he sustained a red knight level of injuries at this spot, okay? He's going to be shot in the calf. He's going to be shot in the thigh on the same leg. He's going to have his left arm mangled. And he's going to refuse to leave the field. When his men asked him, should, should we retreat? He responded, not yet. Just two words, not yet, right? Finally, a mini ball is going to rip through his left cheek and come out is, is going to come out uh, out of his jaw. And this is going to drop him. He falls face first into the sunken road. The only reason why he doesn't die and drown in his own blood is because he landed on his hat, which had a hole in it. And the blood drained out of his hat. Otherwise, he would have drowned in his own blood. Going back to Keene and his wife. They're standing on the sunken road, and Keene suddenly has trouble breathing to the point where he thought he was having a heart attack. They rushed him back to his car. He started to feel a little bit better. But he's got to be completely overcome with emotion, and he just doesn't know. He's never been there before. He doesn't understand it, but it, it, he just kind of freaks out. Sometime later, he ends up at a, uh, at a friend's house who's having a party, and they have a psychic there. And they're having fun. You get readings, and they're all going around. And he's going to play along. He's going to get... he's. He's going to get a reading done. The psychic does his reading and asks him, do you believe in reincarnation? And he goes, I don't know why. He goes, because as I'm doing your reading, he goes, you were mumbling. Do you, do you remember this? He goes, no. He goes, you kept mumbling, not yet. Keen had no idea why he thought he, why he would say that. So one day he picks up the Civil War magazine and reads that story I just told about. And he finds out that John uh, B. Gordon's words, not yet, were said at that spot attack. He thought he was having a heart attack yet. So around here in that same article, he sees the picture of John John B. Gordon. By happenstance, it looks exactly like him. Oh, facial. wow. And it freaks him out. On his birthday, his 30th birthday, he's going to have a sharp pain in his jaw to the point when he has to go to the hospital. So he gets to the hospital. The doctor says, I don't know what the hell's wrong with you. There's nothing physically wrong with you. And he just didn't understand what the pain in his jaw was. Then he found out later that when John B. Gordon had his injuries to his jaw at Antietam, how old was he? He was 30, wow. the same age. Wow. And so he spent the rest of his, you know, whatever, and this is he's, this is 20 years ago now, whatever it was, wondering if maybe he's the reincarnated spirit of, of John Brown Gordon. So it's it's wow. neat when you, when, you, when you kind of study these because, again, you never know. This is a guy who was an assistant fire chief, who wasn't some wacko, didn't know the history. For whatever reason, he had this connection to that spot. And as he went to see that psychic, stuff came out that he didn't know he was even saying and he found what that meant after he didn't know that story at the time and then the pain on the jaw so it's tough to say you never know and I, I this story actually was kind of a not a national story but it was a quasi story in the ghost community because it was one that they really couldn't debunk because they didn't he was just one of those guys or kind of like the story we talked about last time with the three women in the elevator at gettysburg yeah yeah where there are some people you're just going to believe their words they're not the type who are going to make up stories and this is one of those guys makes you wonder you know so maybe he's uh maybe maybe gordon's back maybe wow. he is that's great you know, maybe he's still maybe he's still pissed at jubal early <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I would be if I was Gordon. I'd be really pissed. He needs to find the reincarnation of that guy and they can have it out. Yeah, exactly. It's like, funny. So... He walks by a guy early. He goes, hey, like that Spider-Man thing. Yeah. And they just start fighting in the street and nobody knows why. Yeah. Hey, fucker. Like, right. You didn't let me attack. 
Lee's bad old man, my ass. <laughs> I just find those stories fascinating no, that because, fat. because you know what though, because the one, th- a lot of these stories you can kind of debunk and maybe you can, but the ones that makes you get, you give you the chills and go, Whoa, right. Those are the ones, those are the best stories. And, and yeah. you know, again, whether they're true or not, whether they're fabrications or folklore, they're still, uh, they're still cool, cool stories to hear and to say. That is really cool. Yeah. That's a good one. I like that. Mm. So is it my turn again? It's your mm-hmm. turn again. Okay. I'm going to take us to battle of Franklin to, Carnton House. So this is a large two-story, 22-room, early 1800s brick mansion. Not only is there a presence that lives there that is referred to as the general, who is often on the second floor, and some say it is Patrick Claiborne. He's actually the main spirit that probably haunts this place, this area around Carton House. And this is where the generals, including Claiborne, were brought after the battle after the battle and laid out on the porch. So you had Granberry, Claiborne, Othel, States Rights, just uh, who was the other one, Darren, that was there? There was Otho, Claiborne, States Rights, uh, well, Granberry, uh, Strahl. Granberry. Strahl. Right, Granberry. Strahl was there. Um, Granberry is always the one I have a tough time remembering. I don't know why. I always remember Granberry. I never remember uh, Strahl. It's Strahl. That was the one I keep forgetting. And near the house is a graveyard where there's 1,700 Confederate soldiers that are buried. So, of course, it's probably very much an area of like this kind of energy that happens when you experience hauntings. One of the servants was murdered in the kitchen by a jealous field hand. The servant, she apparently haunts the house and she's very mischievous. She plays tricks on people. And of their five children, only two of the Carnton children survived to adulthood. So sometimes I think the children are seen around the house too. But the one that I wanted to talk about, the story I have, is... Uh, the ghost of Patrick Claiborne. So apparently sometimes he'll be on the back porch just kind of pacing. So you can see him like, you know, if you're in the house on a tour or whatever, you can kind of see him out of the corner of your eye or whatever. Sometimes you can hear him upstairs pacing around. But one person apparently had an entire conversation with him because apparently he will go over and talk to lone people. So the spirit goes over to this one person and starts talking the battle. And the spirit is dressed up in like, you know, the officer's coat. He goes over to this guy and he's talking about how the men aren't going to make it through, how Hood has done them wrong and all this other stuff. And obviously, like Patrick Clay was really pissed off at, at what has happened because his men have been blamed for what's happened at the battle the day before for letting the Union sneak by them. The person that the spirit was talking to thought he was a reenactor who was really into his role. But then the ghost says to this guy, where's your weapon? Where's your gun? And the guy's like, well, I don't have one. And the ghost says, you need to leave now. The battle's going to happen and you need to leave now. And then apparently this ghost turned to another spirit who suddenly appeared and said, well, Govan, if we were to die, let us die like Ben. And then just disappeared. Wow. And that's apparently been a story that has happened to a few people that have visit, visited Carton, they've been on their own, and they've had a conversation with the what they call they call him the general. That he comes over and he just talks to them, and they huh. like sometimes like some people just assume it's just like they'll come away like, oh, there was a reenactor, and then you know people will be like, there was no reenactors here today, and I think it's probably one of these unspoken things that probably I'm sure the staff that work there maybe know he's he's around, but I thought that was a really cool story. And then this guy said that after Claiborne disappeared he could hear the sounds of the battle happening immediately oh, wow. afterwards. That's my final ghost story. So if you two have more, then you go right ahead. It's on to Jen next. See, if I saw Claiborne's ghost, the Carnage House, I would ask him, so who won the chess game? Oh, no, I would be like, do you want to play chess? <laughs> I want to know. Well, did you win? Like, what? How, about that? How about that John Bell hood? You hated him, right? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's what would happen you'd get him all mad and then he'd start ranting and everybody would hear he, him he, he would turn into captain caveman at that moment so yeah. bouncing around the place and that's yeah. that, then it turned to a like, poltergeist can i get you a beer oh wait i forgot you don't drink sorry but she's got the hole in his mouth and come on you know. oh, god but yeah that but I, I, but I, I thought that was that's a, a good really story good, though i thought that was that that's, that's actually really one, of, one that's actually one of my favorite ones just because he apparently he's the type of ghost that just comes over and he starts talking to you and some people just assume like the conversation goes that it's just like you're talking to a reenactor, but then another one will come along and it's like, oh no, we're not talking to a reenactor and what happened to this guy happens. Those are the stories and it's like a lot of these times people see these things and it's by themselves and you know, it'd be amazing to have some kind of experience like that, I think. Mm-hmm. Just to, you know, especially if you hear the battle afterwards, you got to put yourself in the moment of what what they must have been going through and stuff like and kind of live their emotions, their feelings that yeah. very time. But the thing is, is how you know? many, you know, if you have an experience like that, like you go to Franklin and you have that experience and you start telling people like how many people are going to believe you, you know, that you, you witness this. 
Well, probably not. But you know what's important is you believe what you think you saw. Exactly. Right? If yeah. you think if you think you yeah. saw it, if you if you're pretty sure, that's your own private experience, right? Yeah. And and that's the um, thing with all this is it doesn't matter if you believe or you don't. This is part of the history of the Civil War and it plays into it in a huge way and we all experience it in different ways and whether we see them or not doesn't matter it's it but it's also like you said Darren it's a fun thing to discuss like you know the campfire stories well, and stuff exactly too. Yeah, I mean that, that's what's is. great about it it's, it's 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 you know who who knows if any of these stories we talked about you know the, the Gordon story or the, the Mr. Mm -hmm. Dead story or the Iverson Pitt Mr. story Dead. <laughs> Mr. Dead you know <laughs> Claiborne's but... horse is no longer Dixie he's Mr. <laughs> Dead but it's fun to talk about and that's what's great about it is, is you know and you never you know don't let anybody ever tell you believe one thing or the other mm -hmm. it's what you what you believe is what you believe and that's just that's just life in general yeah. but it's um but it's pretty interesting now i heard a rumor mary that jen's got a story i'm not gonna like and i'm not gonna lie to you i'm intrigued by this i'm intrigued yeah there's one i know you're not gonna like the other one is kind of in the vein of about the story mary just talked about with okay. the people interacting with Tyburn. my friend and i were at petersburg and completely by accident, we landed there on the 150th anniversary, like when the siege started. And so we're, we're, walk, we're driving around and we had stopped at an area where there weren't a lot of people. There weren't a lot of people for the whole event, but um, we could hear like soldiers marching. And then we heard a command and it went silent. So when we got back to the front, the, one of the guides was like, how was your, how was your, you know, your auto tour? We're like, oh, it was great. We heard soldiers marching, but we couldn't see anybody. We don't know where they were. And he goes, we didn't have any reenactors over there. So we heard marching and there was supposedly nobody there. Wow. And he, my friend and I both heard it. We're like, where is that coming from? And we're like, apparently, yeah, we don't know. But so that was interesting. Wow. So it was kind of like the same thing, like you said, where they were interacting or hearing something yeah. that sounded like it was there now. You can't see it. And it wasn't there. I had a similar experience at Chickamauga where I was sitting on Snodgrass Hill with one of my friends and I heard all this cannon fire and I'm like, oh, there must be a reenactment going on. And I said something to them later when we were at dinner. I'm like, so what'd you think of all the cannons? And he's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, no, the cannons. All I heard were the birds. I'm like, wow. So I went and I was like looking it up afterwards to see if there had been anything. There had been nothing that day. And I was like, whatever I heard, it was, it was cannon fire. It was artillery. Yeah. Well, the cannon fire battlefield is, is pretty common. I mean, as far as yeah. like, people reporting stories. Yeah. You know, I remember, yeah. I remember I'm staying at the old General Lee headquarters over there on, on Chambersburg Street where they tore it down when they read when the, um, the ABT re redid that. And I remember lying in bed one night and you could hear distant cannon. And it was midnight, one o'clock in the morning. You know, there's not a cannon. And you can tell the difference between cannon fire and thunder, even heat lightning, it, it lights the sky up. So, you know, you hit, there's something, there's something, there's something that, you know, that, that stays there. There's no question. But that Chamberlain quote, right? You know, that's in great field, something stays and abides. Whether it's true or not, people believe it. People, some people do, and people have their own personal experiences. And it's cool to talk about them. And so if people believe it, that's cool too. But at least to talk about it, it's always, it's, it's still a good story, right? Exactly. No, it's, we all have these own, our experiences. And maybe by, you know, like talking about them, like other people might talk about their own experiences too, which is it's good to hear what other people experience on battlefields, you know? And Jen, you had another one, right? I do. And I know Darren's not going to like this one. At least once a year, I go visit my friends that live in Sharpsburg and they live in a house that's been there since at least the 1780s, was definitely there during the Battle of Antietam. After the battle, they found soldiers. There were two Confederates dead in what was their summer kitchen. And then there was another one found out back by the well. And all three of them had been killed by a, a shell that hit the house. There's been activity there pretty much every time I've gone. But one time I was there and I woke up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. And I rolled over to get out of bed. And there was a soldier standing in the window on the second floor. <laughs> and I was like, oh my uh, God. we were both, I mean, I was startled. He was startled. And I was like, I'm just going to go use the restroom. I'll be back in a minute. And if you want to be gone when I get back, that's great. When I came back, he, like, I didn't see him, but I felt like he had stayed behind to apologize and then laugh, like, sorry about that. But it was just, it was one of the weirdest, because, like, I couldn't, re like, I could just make out an outline. Yeah. But it was definitely a Civil War soldier. And I'm like, okay, that's not a reenactor playing tricks. I'm on the second floor. It was just, it was one of the weirdest things that's happened to me at their house. That is creepy. I know I've, I've been in their house before too. And it was very much like, I remember walking in there and thinking like, whoa, shit happened here. Yeah. Especially in that room where like there was the blood stain and stuff. And yeah. Was like, that was the, whoa. that was the summer kid. That was the summer kitchen. That's yeah. where two of the soldiers were found. Yeah. But you can still see 
what looks like blood stains on the floor uh-huh. in this room. And it's funny because the way, like when my friends were renting this house, they had a rug, the homeowners had a rug over that. Well, now that my friend and her husband bought it, she's got that area wide open. Nice. There's nothing covering it. So you can see it when you walk in. Nice. Yeah. This is great about some of these old places that are, you know, our friend Bill in Gettysburg, one of the places yep. he has, his house is, is right along the, uh, the Lee retreat, you know, heading out of town down by Knoxville road where the first shot marker was. Oh, okay. And you, you had soldiers who would go there to be rest and, you know, hurt soldiers. And on his stairs, you can still see blood going up and down the stairs into the wood, like blood yeah. stains where the soldiers, kind of like the lady farm, you can see the fingers on the floor. It's oh. kind of like that, but it's just, it's just a dark black dried blood into the wood and you can just picture the, the soldiers all sitting there on the steps waiting to go up upstairs to, and get whatever is going to get done to amputate whatever in the room i slept in by the way and i didn't find out till later there's a lot of places like that in these battlefields and what's great is is when you go to them and you visit and stay in some of these old bed and breakfast these old places and you feel the character of these houses you can you can you can really feel some of the stuff that went yeah, on yeah you can mm-hmm yeah. yeah, you definitely can. So who's next for a story? I'm trying to figure out a soldier who's 20 feet tall. They would have won the war themselves, probably. <laughs> Who had 20-foot soldiers? Hope was a Massachusetts man. I don't know. There, it was Confederate soldiers that were killed in the house, so I have no idea. Probably by, by the 20-foot soldier. Maybe it was A.P. Hill coming to say hi. <laughs> Get out of my room. <laughs> looking, for, looking, for his, looking for his penicillin. <laughs> I don't have it. Get away from me. Do you have my medicine? <laughs> He's looking for his, he's either looking for his penicillin or his money from Burnside. Oh, exactly. Exactly. He, he but no, up the road. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a whole bunch of great stories. But any more stories from you, Jen? I have, if we, I have um, one quick one that took place at Gettysburg that's yep. kind of fun. That okay. I had taken my sister because she wanted to go somewhere. So I said, why don't we do Gettysburg? And she freaked out because she loves ghost stories and stuff. So we were walking through the National Cemetery and it wasn't dark, but it was like the sun was going down so we're walking through and I start seeing a smoke ring go through the cemetery and I thought oh my gosh if she's smoking I'm a killer and she can stay here so I looked and she didn't have like she did she had no cigarette in her hand she wouldn't do that in the cemetery which I knew but that's the only explanation I could think of for where I'm seeing like this perfect smoke ring and I mean it was too big to be a cigarette smoke ring but at the time I'm not going okay maybe that's a cannon because there was no reenactment going on or anything and it was just like randomly in the middle of the cemetery was a giant smoke ring. Well, anytime you go into these places, you get up in the morning. And I like to get up early, and especially Gettysburg, and, and take a walk down East Cemetery Hill and see all the fog over there in the fields and, and just the, the mist and off a of, of yeah. Cops Hill. And it's just it's just a cool, eerie type of transcendent type feeling when you see some of these places like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and there's different types of energy that you encounter too on these battlefields as well. Like for instance, I think I mentioned this last year, you go out to Bragg's headquarters at Chickamauga, you know, fuck that. That's not, yeah, your cell phone doesn't work, whatever. But then you go to somewhere like Snodgrass Hill and the energy for some reason is very powerful. It's very positive because of this kind of what the Union soldiers had to give in order to hold uh, Chattanooga after Thomas left the, those guys there to kind of be the, you guys need to stay and hold this and you might get, get taken prisoner. There's a very much a strong energy at some of these places and that that's one of them. But then you have places like, where is it, Darren? Like Sp- Spotsylvania, right? That is really... There are places you go, you can feel. There's a couple of places that, I mean, if you go, Spotsylvania has a creepy feel to it. Mary Surratt's grave in Washington. Okay, Mount Olivet has a creepy feeling to it. Where I was a week or so ago was the hanging site of the Salem witches here up here in Massachusetts. Oh, that, yeah, that place was I, like, yeah, and yeah. He videoed me when he was place. there, and I was like, oh, it's um, creepy. And it's tough to find because it's behind like a little Walmart up a hill, and it's not really advertised. But you, if you know where to look, you find it. And you go up there, and, all, and you know, there's a couple of rocks piled up, and there's, some, you know, but it's a creepy, negative feel to it. So what, whatever is there, you, whatever energy was there, you can you can feel that the air leave the room in some of these places. Mm-hmm. And in battlefields, are just like that too. A lot of these places in battlefields, you go. It's and I always try to explain this to people. It's like it's like when you go to a party and you go upstairs to use the bathroom, and there's no twenty foot soldier in the window. You just have to go, <laughs> right? There's no one there. But you you walk up there, you shut the door, and you kind of peek in the medicine cabinet real quick, and you have that feeling like I hope no one's looking at me, but you feel like you're being watched, right? That feeling is what you have in, in all over the place in certain places, you know, parts of Gettysburg, absolutely, in yeah. Teton, yeah. places like that. So you always feel like um, there's eyes upon you. Maybe it's just maybe it's just in your head, 
but there are certainly places where the energy is stronger than others and you certainly feel like you're in somebody else's turf yeah and, and yeah. so that that's certainly one of those places you know well that that's what happened to me you know in Earps woods well reynolds woods is i wandered in there one time started going down the path and all of a sudden i started feeling kind of this tightness in my chest like anxiety and i'm like why am i feeling that and i remember i started to look around and i was like looking through the trees to see what i could see i was picking up on the anxiety the soldiers felt i think and I was I where Reynolds be. had been killed. And I remember just backing, I walked out backwards because I was like, I can't be in here right now. I just remember stepping right into the woods and, and this feeling of anxiety came over me and I had to leave. And But it was just creepy how I was like looking around and then I would walk a few steps ahead and look around even more. And I was, I don't know what I was looking for, but I felt a lot of anxiety being in there. So I ended up having to just leave the woods. Yeah. Oh, there are places you feel like you just don't belong. Sometimes you got to go mm -hmm. and, you know. Sometimes I've had that happen. Go. Yeah. And yeah. regarding Jen's tall soldier, I, for some reason, I'm imagining the, the dude from House on Haunted Hill. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Like, that's, that's like the guy with the cane. Have you seen that, Jen? Yeah. Oh yeah, my, when he peeks down the, under the fucking bed, no thing. Like, holy when shit. He, when he's like, floating above the ground, like six yeah. inches above. What kind or of no, haunt, no, it's haunting of, a haunting of Hill House. Haunting is what, Hill, Hill House. House is what it is. Yeah, haunting of Hill the, House. The, the haunting of D.H. Hill's house. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I think we've you know. got our meme for this episode. <laughs> but, you know. I've heard one explanation for that where they're like floating above the floor, or like you can see their knees on the floor. It's like if that house has been remodeled or has right. settled, yeah. that they're walking on the old floor. And that's why you only mm. see part of their legs or they're yeah. walking above the floor because they're walking where the floor used to be. Well, there's been stories like in Rome where people will see Roman soldiers walking. It looks like they have their bodies under the ground. It's because they're walking on the original ground. It's been, it's been yep. built up in time. So, you, so there's yep. been stories like that. So these residual types that go on and on and on. But oh, I'm not going to sleep tonight now. I'm going to think there's a guy looking at my window now. And I'm on the second floor. It'll be the, it'll, and it'll be the guy from um, Hill House with the bowler hat. Oh, we're going to fit probably a Kepi hat. I, well, I got you with Bent Neck Lady last year on this episode. Remember that? No. You know, <laughs> I don't know why you are the way you are. <laughs> but, it, but it was, uh, yeah, that, there's, some, there's some scary stories. So hopefully people will enjoy this. Hopefully people can have their own stories. Maybe somebody will shoot us their own story about something happened, whatever. I think we got a couple like of them said, last year from people. But I think Jen has yeah. has one to end us off with that is kind of hum that is a humorous Yeah, I was, gonna leave, I was gonna leave Darren with a funny one. So yeah. maybe okay. this will get rid of the nightmares. So I was I was researching all this and I realized that we have not told one President Lincoln ghost story. And he's one of the most popular like ghosts of the White House and stuff like that. So I brought my favorite President Lincoln haunting the White House story. So years ago, um, Winston Churchill was staying in what they call the Lincoln bedroom now. And one of his favorite things to do to relax was to take a hot bath and just smoke a cigar and just, you know, lounge. And then, so he, he did that one evening. So he gets out of the tub and exits the bathroom wearing nothing but the cigar. So he's just totally naked, just goes into the other room for whatever reason with just the cigar. And he comes into the, the main room. And the ghost of President Lincoln is standing there leaning against the mantle in that room. And Churchill looks <laughs> in and goes, well, Mr. President, I'm afraid you have me at a disadvantage. He said the ghost of President Lincoln smiled and disappeared. Oh, my God. And, <laughs> and Churchill went to his staff the next day and said, I am not spending another night in that accursed room. You put me somewhere else. But no, I love that one. Wow. I, can just, I can kind of just picture it. He's like, uh. uh I know. I could totally I see Churchill. What, what what goes through your mind if you're standing there and you're all together and you take a look and there's Lincoln staring at you, especially smiling. Yeah. <laughs> That's why it's so funny. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I can only I can only imagine the fear of, of that. But there's been a lot of stories about the Lincoln better Abraham Lincoln's ghost mm -hmm. in the White House, as you mentioned that. A whole yep. bunch of different stories of yeah. And he would he was someone who himself was was big in a seances because of Mary Lincoln, mm -hmm. all that, all those things. So he was a very spiritual type of guy as well. But yeah, you hear a lot of stories about about his ghost and other ghosts in the White House. That's gotta be a, that's gotta be a creepy situation to see, see something like that. I just like that one because it's so funny. You can totally picture it happening too. It's like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, Churchill. Churchill was pretty quick witted, so yeah, you can totally see that being his comeback. Oh, completely, that like, oh my gosh, but this is kind of awkward. Hi. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we got a disadvantage right now, and then. Yeah. In a British accent, you know. A big, big cigar going. Price there. Yeah, he just probably you know. comes out like, <laughs> like all cool and stuff, and then he sees the, the ghost. And he's like, uh, "Hello." Oh yeah. It's like uh, in well, the movies. Think... He just standing there, and the cigar burns up and drops. Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Funny 
it's so funny. Well, I think this was fun. It's definitely a good time doing this. It it certainly is. And I think it's always fun. We can talk about the time of this all night long. But like we said, we do have to sleep tonight at some point. And, (laughs) you know, know, that's a guarantee. I'm I like probably see, you know, 20 foot tall naked Abraham Lincoln sitting on my window smiling now. You'll have some kind of weird fucked up fever dream tonight or something. (laughs) Writing writing Mr. Dead through my bedroom. Mr. Dead. (laughs) I can only imagine the stuff we'll see as these things all kind of come together. So, so Claiborne's yeah, so horse is... is now Mr. Dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it could be. It could be Mr. Dead. Who Mr. knows? T- so this will be great. So but this will drop a couple days before Halloween. So Halloween's one of my favorite holidays. I mean, yeah. how do you not like, you know, candy and costumes and, you know, all the stuff that goes with it? It'll be a good time. Some Halloween parties to go to this year. Mary got a couple to go to. I'll nice. be dressing up in my uh, Union Blues, I think. We'll see how that goes. And and by the time, you know, this drops, we'll have, um, obviously, we've had our round table. Yeah, we'll have had too. our costume we'll round out. table. And... I hope everybody dresses up for that. I'm just going to assume, congratulations, Leonard, for winning the book. At this point, you just kind of just <laughs> Leonard will somehow wear the best costume. <laughs> oh, if you can imagine if he does. Oh I hope God. he does. And he's not going to hear this till after. That's about yeah, that'll be that'll be hilarious. Oh, it would be. Oh, if it does, it does. So yeah, so so what's coming up next, Mayor? So next we will be talking about Barksdale. We're gonna do another episode about a general, and this time we're gonna talk about a Confederate general. So we're gonna talk about Barksdale. And then after that, we will have Battle of Bull's Gap. And then we'll be taking a week off. And then we will be back with you at the end of no because that will get us near the end of November. We'll be talking about Spring Hill. Uh, yeah. No, we got the other, the next book club coming up down the road as well. Your yep. time goes so fast when you're having fun, Mayor. This is a good time speaking of laughs. Jen, always having a great time having you on. Yeah, when you thank escape you. Thank you, Jen. Tonight. That was awesome. You know, <laughs> you know, with the, you know, it's a twenty foot tall one of the Celtics looking in the window. You know, <laughs> but that's going to be a that'll be a fun thing to think about later on. But I, I love these stories. They're great stories. So hopefully people enjoy these, and hopefully people have a great Halloween. Hopefully have a good time. Stay safe. And go out there with all the the ghouls and goblins and Reese's peanut butter cups and everything else that makes Halloween so much good. Yep. Yeah. So thank you again, Jay Price for being our guest for our second Halloween extravaganza, apparently live from the boo barn. Right. (laughs) Thank you guys for inviting me back. Anytime. Yeah. Now you got a, yeah, you got a whole year to think about stories for next year now. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. I'll be a good time as well. Maybe next year I'll, I'll have a story of something. Dude, looking at my window. You somehow it'll, knew that was going to get to me too. That's that's amazing. It'll, I see. <laughs> it'll be Mister. It'll be the ghost of Mister Dead. You can talk about Mr. it, Mister Dead. <laughs> Mister Dead. It'll be a horse that's twenty feet tall with a soldier on. Exactly with Churchill on his back, with a cigar, <laughs> naked. Afraid you have me at a disadvantage. <laughs> Well, there Good you go. Time. You already have your line when he shows up. Yeah. You're ready. Exactly. I want to practice that. So anyway, so hope everybody enjoyed the episode. Uh, thanks to you, Fincheru, and of course, you, Jay Price. Always a good time to talk to you. And um, everybody will talk to you guys soon on the other side, as we'd like to say. So we'll see you guys later. Happy Halloween. Bye, everybody. Happy Bye. Halloween. Bye. Ooh. <laughs> see you guys Ooh. later. Bye.